everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming to my talk. Uh, if you'd like to, I have some detailed slides, so if you'd like to get into those details, please feel free to click the QR code. I promise it's safe. I don't know how to make it not safe, so, um, and follow along for your use. My name is Lacey Harbour. I have a background in molecular biology, but fell, unfortunately or fortunately, into regulatory and quality and clinical studies. And today I want to uh, present some ideas to everyone here uh, about how medical devices are being made and how they're going to be made in the future. And during this process, I'm going to highlight some areas of concern that is particularly applicable to our cybersecurity partners and uh, how we're not really ready for the future of the medical device uh, world. So it goes without saying that AI is changing everything. AI is particularly changing the healthcare ecosystem. And this is a good thing for us because us as a population, we're aging. And our population isn't growing with new members as much as it used to. Uh, with that, we're going to need a new point of care, new care, standard of care treatments. Um, and that's not going to be doable without AI. So AI being integrated into the proce uh, products or changing the scope of these products. And um, my world is regulatory. We like to bucket products into regulated and unregulated product. You can have the exact same instrument or device or whatever. And if you define it to be intended for a medical purpose like diagnosis, it's a medical device. So you have all these controls in place for, to uh, deal with that product, to develop it, to manage it, to monitor it. Um, but if it's not a medical device, then you don't have to monitor it to the same level of scrutiny. And that can be a, a concern. So when something's called a medical device, it's particularly in the US, it's all depending on its intended use. Now, with the ecosystem changing, with the scope of the products changing, the intended use is not just the only thing we need to be worried about or be mindful of. We need to uh, be mindful of how it's being used in the healthcare system, what data sources and attributes it's plugging into, um, who are the end users? It's not just the physician anymore. There's different voice of customers that need to be paid attention to, especially when you're building a product that should be uh, secure and safe and effective across the entire uh, use and the, its, its entire ecosystem. In the past, I used to have to be worried just about the FDA in the US market. Now I have to be mindful of all of these entities, these regulatory entities that are listed on the screen. And that's just the US market. Uh, I'm part of an FDA collaborative community. I'm one of the co-leaders of it. And we have an NLP that just scans the internet, um, picking up sources that we've deemed reliable and allowing us to analyze all these global sources into a one-stop shop. Within this year alone, there have been 85 sources or uh, materials that we as a regulatory equality partners must analyze and communicate to our companies to take action upon. And I don't know if you really appreciate how much freaking work that is and how damn near impossible that is, because not only do I have to analyze it and then I have to teach the executives this information, then I have to get buy-in that they need to update procedures and policies. We have to do a business risk impact and see how much, you know, it just keeps going and going, going. Ultimately, you have to train the, in, the people within the manufacturing line, even what they can and cannot do. This is, this is a huge task. And of course, it's going to be easier based on the size of your company, or maybe not. There's, uh, each company has their own problems with this. It's not just the regulatory ecosystem. It's also the relationship with our customers. So as medical device manufacturers, um, you know, you always think the customer is the physician or the patient, but that's not always the case. We are plugging in our products into health delivery organizations. And so, and they have to navigate their own set of regulations and they have their requirements. Um, and so we have to make sure that our products interact with that. Also, 
with the future of these products, again, AI enablement is a really data hungry process, no matter where it's plugged into. And who owns the data? Well, the EHR companies like Epic. You think they wanna share that data with the medical device manufacturer so that we can have good quality outputs? Not necessarily. So we have to build those relationships with the medical device manufacturers, the EMR, and any other um, applications that are plugging in to the hospital delivery organization or uh, um, HDO. So FDA is seeing this, and I, I, I like to, they're not the only agency globally that's really making progress, but they are really being public about it, and it's accessible. Any of you guys can go on the FDA website and see all sorts of initiatives that they're putting into place to make sure that the public is being heard and they're actually engaging patients even. They're, they're really paying attention to the voice of customer and how these products are truly used. For example, you know, they'll even, they'll ask about uh, like the workflow in a laboratory even. Um, and so I, I highly recommend and encourage everyone to go check out these resources. So, but when the FDA is in particular and they're working with an international group called the IMDRF, um, when the FDA is, is hearing and seeing where the industry is going, um, they, they try, they're trying to grow along with industry so that they're not holding us back. Um, and one particular use case I'm going to talk to you guys about today is called the medical device production system. Um, but before I can get into this future device, essentially, I want to level set everybody. Um, it, who's here familiar with the total product life cycle? I have, I have a handful of people. All right, so the total product life cycle is basically the inception of a product all the way to the end of life of a product. And so I put here, together here a representation of any kind of QMS or quality management system that represents a total product life cycle. And it looks like a cell, and I really, uh, maybe the biologist is, is being a little biased in me, but it really is like feedback loops, like what you get in a cellular function. So you could break it down, in my mind, a total product life cycle into design controls, production and process controls, and then there's feedback loops for improvements. And any of those improvements could be like failure on the field, it could be a non-conformance from a manufacturing line, it could be a corrective action that's discovered from anything else, or regulatory updates. But this is too complicated to uh, really talk about and use. So I further uh, simplified the total product life cycle schema into these two basic buckets. So you can see where I have the QMS and then I've broken it down to design controls and production and process controls where you have a prototype of a device. It can be, any, it can be a digital device or a cyber device as they call it in the uh, US. It could be... Um, a tongue depressor, um, depending on the classification. Um, but say that you, you, you have the prototype, you test it, hey, it's good, I'm going to now um, scale up and manufacture this. So then you uh, transfer to manufacturing, you test it, hey, the manufacturing is working well, now we can actually start mass producing these products. And then you manufacture and then you test it again. And then finally, if they match all the quality control or QC checks, that device is released out into the wild or software or whatever. Within each of these steps, there's feedback loops. So something can kick, something bad can happen during this process to kick you all the way back to design of you know feasibility and design phase. So, but the, at the end of the day, the take home message is the output, the final device is from that whole end to end total product life cycle within the QMS. So now that I've kind of given you a very high level of the basics of what currently exists, let's talk about the future. The future of our products are going to be, at, it's going to be precise, it's going to be personalized, it's going to be at the point of care. And there are several different industries and sectors and technologies that are helping pushing um, our standard of care practice to this point. But the orthopedic um, sector has really been leveraging the 3D printing technology um, to bring us closer to that uh, 
precise, personalized, and point of care product. And I'm going to reintroduce the idea of a medical device production system to you. And so this isn't the only use case involved that, that does this, but this these um, orthopedics, I guess because I mean, to be honest, it's human carpentry, so they can, <laughs> the complexity isn't as much as maybe other devices. So they're moving at a very fast pace. And the FDA saw that, and so the IMDRF. So they've started to put together some loose guidelines to help lead um, this medical device production system. So what is the medical device production system, or MDPS? So let's go back again to the schema I showed you all before. Again, the output is a device, right? It's pretty simple, of a total product life cycle of the QMS. Well, a medical produ uh, production system turns that on its head. Now, the output, the device, isn't the final component. And this is a little hard to wrap your head around. It includes the manufacturing. It includes the design phase. So what happens is, I'm a medical device manufacturer and I'm going to make a medical device production system, an MDPS. I'm going to design the, the production line just as I would before, except now I'm going to realize that this production system is going to be part of the device in the healthcare delivery organization. So there will be manufacturing in the hospital and then I will allow a certain range of scope or um, specs that can be allowed for the hospital to manufacture. And so from that end to end process, they can design the product and they can manufacture it. And then the output is part of the entire device. It's, the output alone is no longer the singular device. So if any of you are familiar with uh, the, the quality system regulation or 13485 standards, your wheels may be turning like, how the hell do you control this? And that, that is a big question. But it, this, the precursors to this are existing right now. Um, here I have an image of some 3D printed EBM uh, joint implants made, uh, they're called uh, trabecular titanium, and they allow for bone and growth, and they are all patient matched. And these are printed in the hospital as we speak from a medical device manufacturer. And so I'm going to kind of introduce at a high level this current process, and then we're gonna talk about how this is going to become the medical device production system. So, Say I'm a patient, I have a really janked up uh, shoulder, and the physician says, hey, the standard products on the market, they're not gonna work for you. We need to give you a custom device. So they're gonna send me to get a fresh CT scan. I'm gonna get my fresh CT scan, and that DICOM file is going to go to the radiologist, to the surgeons, and they're going to segment that file with the medical device manufacturer or the designer. They will identify the defects, and then they will agree on how the physician uh, wants to approach it. So the physician is really close with the designer through this whole process. Um, after they just discuss it, the designer will then take that DICOM file and convert it to an STL file within like a 3D CAD program like Magix or something similar to that. And then they will, um, propose potential designs. And the designs don't come out of anywhere. It's based off of historical data, um, recall data from standard devices, but it'll be matching what the how the physician wants to perform the surgery and what the physician actually wants to do. And so there's a feedback loop there until the physician gives the green light and then it is released. Um, but just because you can design something doesn't mean you can actually print it. Within a 3D printer, there's XYZ um, zones and each zone has a different behavior. It's, it, they're their own animal. Um, so what happens is that the designer will give the STL file to the production engineer, and then they will convert it to a machine file and determine if it's possible to actually 3D print that geometry. And some of that may be tied to demand planning because you obviously, you'll have a large bed and you may be printing more than one patient's devices at a time. And so um, you may have to strategize that. But it's not uncommon for that device to be pit kicked back to the physician essentially when if the, design, uh, the production engineer says, no, we can't do that. 
After it's printed, there are a lot of supports that need to be removed. And so typically it's like a CNC or a saw that helps remove those products. And then it goes to a QC check. And the QC check is just not the outside dimension, but the inside integrity. These devices have to may, um, you know, resist weight and movement. And so if there's any kind of flaw internally, that can cause device failure. So there's a lot of checks that have to be happened with QC samples. So what might be of interest is let's, let's dissect a little bit more detail of the first half of that from the relationship of the health delivery organization and the medical device manufacturer. Um, I'm not going to go into all the detail of every bit of this schema, but this is just a representation of what that um, interaction, data interaction might look like. But what I really want to highlight, and I, I see some of you shaking your head or maybe have some concerns, you might have noticed that there's something called a PAC server, and that holds all of the DICOM data for pretty much everything. And how does that data get to the medical device manufacturer will depend on the relationship the medical device manufacturer has with the health delivery organization. It could be a nurse downloading it. It can be a, uh, on a flash drive and handing it to the device manufacturer. It could be an email. It could be a, a CD. Or it could be connected directly into um, the medical device's server. The medical device manufacturer may have a software that sits on top of the PAC server. Or it may have a, they may have a relationship where they have access to the EMR. And now if they have access with the EMR, they have to have a relationship with the EMR. So the problem is that I, I want to highlight is I just want to make a note that medical device manufacturers are not HIPAA covered entities. And I'm just going to leave that there and let you kind of think on what that means. So um, once... Once the design is, is considered uh, safe, from the, at least from a uh, failure mode analysis perspective, then it goes back to the um, internally. So now we're completely inside the medical device manufacturer side of the network. Um, Many device manufacturers are moving forward to using what's called machine learning operations. Not, and, and this is just a high level example of, of uh, how that can look within the network. You have containers, of course, that are cross talking with different um, instruments. And then you can also have these containers cross talking with other systems like your uh, product lifecycle management system, your quality management system, or your um, ERPs, or even other sites if you have multiple sites interacting. And that's something that would be a goal for medical device manufacturers with MDPS. So that it'd be nice to have communications to see the success of the products across all of your deployed MDPSs. Um, and so you can see here that there, again, you may be the design engineer. How did you get the data from the designer? Well, it could have been put up on a server. It could have been a flash drive handed to you. And you, put, you work on this uh, product for the machine file, the machine planning, on your personal laptop or on your work laptop, because the data processing for this is quite substantial. And then how does that data get to the EBM in the first place? Again, it could be a flash drive. There's a lot of flash drives used in manufacturing, especially with smaller firms. Um, so there's concerns there. But this is an MDPS. This whole workflow that I presented, it's precursor to MDPS. And it exists right now. Here are just some firms that are doing this right now. And this, this isn't even all of them. Um, there's a lot of research going into how to get the MDPS. And... So what is the MDPS? Well, just for simplicity purposes, think about that whole workflow and put it in a box. You get the CT scan, you plug that DICOM in this box. There might be people remote, like designers or even people monitoring the success of the instrument uh, remotely. And um, the physician is working with some kind of software interface to say, hey, I want the design to look this way, and then they press go, and out pops your final device. 
Now, if anyone's familiar with 3D printing, the post-processing is going to be a problem for the future MDPS, but it's not going to be unattainable. Um, this, this is, we are working, technology is being researched, mineralization is being researched. This is not like it's not going to be 50 years from now. What's going to make this even more powerful is that you're going to have feedback from the surgical suite into the MDPS. So you're going to get clinical outcomes. But again, to get that, you have to have the relationship with the medical device manufacturer. So AI is going to be necessary to do this. Um, there's no way that you're not going to be able to have this without. So let's highlight some of the areas where AI is being researched even right now and where it's going to be plugged into this MDPS. And I mean, if you look this up online, you're going to see a slew of papers because this is the low hanging fruit. Again, human carpentry, everyone's going for this. Um, first place, automatic segmentation. Um, have a mask, highlight the defect, give you recommendations on the defect. The radiologist, the surgeon, or whomever can look at that and give yes or no feedback. The next place, um, is the design. You can have all of your data from your field feedback, um, from the designs that exist that are standard to automatically generate design. And all the designer has to do is say, go, no go. And the physician have their inputs as well. And you can use LLMs to generate the surgical technique, which is also considered part of the labeling, which is part of the design or the device. Um, finally, the uh, demand planning, uh, the design transfer, uh, you can have multiple uh, products in the queue and you can determine, hey, this zone, this, pro pro this device needs to be manufactured in this zone, but this patient is suicidal, so they're a higher risk, so that would adjust the demand planning. And uh, that's something, again, you need good connection with the physician and the health uh, HCPs to determine what's correct. And then, of course, the enabling of manufacturing with ML is already in progress and they're just going to miniaturize that and it would make everything more visible and you can uh, monitor the manufacturing in real time. So I, I can't stress enough that maybe with the high level schemas that I presented to everybody, you might kind of detect that we again are not ready for this, but the technology is getting there and we need it. We need it now. We need it yesterday. And, and so Medical device manufacturers need to start being aware of the three customers down the road so that we can have safe and effective products that are consented, that are safe, that have encrypted or, or private. And that's not something medical device manufacturers are always mindful of. We are really in a, a next-gen humanity moment here. Um, here's an example of 3D printing autologous bone. So you have a defect instead of a joint implant, um, you 3D print a mold that's based off the defect, and then you use a bioreactor to print your bone. It's not just orthopedics, it's just the low hanging fruit. We're, I mean, the application is huge and the MDPS is going to be amazing. So we are in a deus um, ex human moment. This is something I, I stole from my friend Nina. And it's true, we are making new humans. And so how are we going to do this safe? I encourage everyone to go to the resources I pointed out, kind of look at the schema, what can you do to encourage this and where we can all like have a better future and better healthcare practice and better standard of care. So I, I appreciate everyone, thank you.